Copenhagen has repeatedly been named the world's most livable city. Ironically, this is mirrored by an unprecedented rise in house prices. Affordability is now a threat to the city's livability. Copenhagen's population dropped to a historic low in the late 80s and early 90s. At this point, the city, close to bankruptcy, was seen as unlivable. Following the adoption of the city strategy to rebrand itself as livable to keep people and tax revenue in the city, the population started to rise and kept rising through the 2000s. Livability markers like healthcare provision, foreign business, education and attainment, and number of cyclists have been following this encouraging population growth. Copenhagen seemingly fulfills a broad spectrum of criteria, a focus on public space with numerous numbers of cafes, cultural and sports facilities. Well-functioning infrastructure like cycle lanes, great public transport and a quick connection to the airport. Harbour baths, ample public spaces, art galleries, events and festivals all make Copenhagen an attractive place to live. But what about the hidden elements of the city, which until now have not been measured by the indices? Until recently, the affordability of the city was excluded from the majority of the indices. The question, who is this livable city for, was being ignored. Although livability trends were on the rise, those related to the city affordances, like development options, freedom of housing burden, equality and freedom from debt have been falling in recent years. In 2015, by adding affordability to the index criteria, Copenhagen fell from 1st to 10th in Monocle's ranking system. Since the advent of the livability agenda in the 1990s, house prices in Copenhagen have risen far faster than the average wage and family income. Houses are now almost 10 times the average yearly salary, in comparison to 1995, where they were four times. If we define affordability as spending less than 40% of our monthly disposable income on housing, only the highest income groups have access to the affordable housing. Now 60% of housing in Copenhagen consists of only two room apartments. What happens if you are more than two? The housing offer is limiting the diversity in household compositions. If you want to be able to afford to live in Copenhagen, your options are limited. You can work non-stop, the equivalent of having three jobs being paid 150 krona per hour. Your work-life balance would be straining. If you only have time to work, then how is Copenhagen livable? On top of this, the housing on offer in Copenhagen is not flexible enough to accommodate the inherent changeability of a household's composition. Living alone, moving in with someone, getting a baby, your kids grow up and leave the house, you get a divorce, you meet someone else, your son moves back in, you need a new home. It's a vicious cycle in which you won't be able to afford the amount of square meters that your family needs. What you could also do, if you can't afford to get a place large enough for your family, is move out to the suburbs, where you can get a house almost three times as big. Your commuting time will explode to two hours instead of the 15 minutes that it took you before, and you'll be giving up on the idea of living in this most livable city. How does housing actually get so unaffordable? Our current production of housing is dominated by a single model. The developer takes out a loan to acquire a plot of land, pay for the construction of the building, and cover the costs of management and design. This combines the actual building costs. To repay the developer's loan, a certain amount of interest goes to the lending institution. On top of that, the developer takes out 20% interest on his initial investment. An additional 25% of VAT sums up the actual market price. To acquire a home, most users take out a long-term mortgage, which includes interest. Additionally, costs of maintenance accumulate over the years. Even though Denmark seems to focus on the profit-driven model, internationally there can be found a variety of alternatives. The Australian Nightingale model, for example, aims at optimising the current model. By reducing construction costs to a minimum and putting a 15% cap on the developer's profit, it drastically reduces the overall lifetime costs. The Community Land Trust Co-op uses the separation of land and building title to create a long-term affordability. In this model, a CLT acquires the land and leases it to the cooperative, who procures housing on behalf of the community. Monthly payment covers the cost of maintenance, management and paying off debt from the initial loan. This structure liberates the users from a mortgage, tying the debt to the co-op rather than the individual. Currently, Copenhagen's housing market is almost exclusively dominated by the developer model, where one size must fit all. But we can demand a city that is custom-made, where bespoke and diverse development models and architecture would give everyone the right to dwell.